Why is Lakeshore Road closed for part of this morning? Why did some of you park away from Walton's lot today? The reason is that on June 6, 1944, the order of the day was issued by the Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, to Allied forces on the eve of D-Day, the first day of the invasion of Normandy. <coughs> Eisenhower had been drafting the order since February 44 and recorded a spoken version on May 28th that was broadcast on British, American, and Canadian radio on D-Day. The marching orders for the liberation of Europe had been given, and Canadian soldiers specifically were headed to Juneau Beach. Today, the Bronte Legion and our community commemorate D-Day across the street from the church at the Bronte Cenotaph. In our scripture day passage today that Warren shared, Jesus gives his marching orders to his followers in that great commission at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is exactly what we did in the baptism of Thomas this morning. It is what we did last Sunday, May 28th, which was Pentecost, in receiving 11 new members by transferring and welcoming nearly 40 newcomers to Walton since COVID at a breakfast that was held before that Pentecost service. In our second reading today from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, Paul gives his marching orders to the people at, in the church of Corinth. Paul orders, and maybe better, advises them in these timeless words. Let's hear what he has to say. Paul begins with the word, finally. Do you ever like to watch murder mysteries? Often when the interrogator of the suspect seems to be finished the interrogation of the prime suspect, they will say, sort of as they're going out the door, finally, and we always know it's not over there. It's not finished. Often the best part of the mystery takes place after the police official says, finally. Paul's best part is this. Finally, brothers and sisters. What? Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. What one of us would not like more rejoicing? Especially this year, with no Stanley Cup parade in Canada, from Vancouver to Montreal, I've always thought the hotbed of hockey was a desert in Nevada. <laughs> or a beach in Florida. The term rejoice was commonly used among early Christians, we're told. It was a, an authentic call to a deep-hearted joy. Maybe that's how we can describe it. It was often used as a salutation or greeting in a letter or face-to-face. -face. Rather than saying, hey guys, well, there would be this sense, rejoice. Jesus sometimes would walk into a room and immediately call people to joy, to joy, rather than the standard hello. Joy is more than plain happiness. It's an inner joy beyond the immediate circumstances we may find ourselves. Be them good or bad, we are to rejoice. 
Sort of what we talk about on the third Sunday of Advent each year. We light the Advent wreath, that candle of joy. Paul's marching orders continue for us when we, they talk about a desire. Paul says he desires for the Corinthian church full restoration. Now, this is not the type of restorations we've done, especially on this 1913 building, over the years, over the decades. We're doing some this year as well. I'm not talking about restoring our outer red bricks, the white blocks, and the mortar that holds it all together in this historically designated sanctuary by the town of Oakville. You see, the need for restoration was a major problem in the church in Corinth. And it couldn't be solved by a mason's skill or a bricklayer's skill. The restoration included healing from those rifts, that conflict, that struggle that existed in the Corinthian church family. There were some major issues in that first century congregation. There were those that were ego-based. Ego-based. There were some people that thought they were so spiritually superior to others and lauded it over them. There was apparently a lot of suing of each other taking place in the congregation. Also, the poor that were in the congregation were sometimes being abused by the wealthier members. And there was sexual abuse, especially with minors. So the Corinthian church that Paul is writing to could be our day too, couldn't it? But it's first century, it's what is present-day Turkey. You see in life the technology changes, but the same issues of right and wrong, the same issues of ego exist centuries later. Paul is saying, heal those rifts, actively address the concerns, sincerely repent and change. Paul reminds those believers that God is a God of love and peace, and God will be with them even in the midst of the strife, but even more so in the midst of the restoration. God had not abandoned them, nor will God abandon them. And that's a message for 2023 in any of the struggles we may find ourselves in. Paul also encourages other marching orders in the Scripture, and it's encourage one another. He's encouraging encouragement. We are called to encourage others in the faith. Encourage others to stand firm when difficulties arise. Gene Zorin says, encouragement is more than simply prayers and notes. God can use us to encourage one another through many verbal, emotional, practical, and spiritual mis- ministries that we can use if you will our mind, body, soul to encourage others. There's a power in the ministry of encouragement. What one of us doesn't feel better with an honest word of encouragement? That's why the informal visiting before the service and after the service and in coffee hour is so important. That encouragement, that opportunity to share with one another, what your week has been like, what your week may be. It's amazing what takes place over a cup of joe. 
encouragement. Now, the next mar marching order may seem hard for us in our very independent, personalized society. Paul says, be of one mind. Well, we treasure. We have our own minds. We have our own individual choices. We have our own individual path. Paul's not talking we should all be sheep doing the same thing. Paul's talking about a sense of unity. In Philippians, he maybe fleshes it out more. Like we think about the flesh in that apple in the you story. He writes to the Philippians, Then make my joy complete. Joy, rejoice. By being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather than in humility value others above yourselves, not looking out for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Maybe this gives us a better sense of what one mind means. Maybe the simple phrase, let us all row in the same direction, captures that idea. The one mind, the one purpose, the one goal of living out in our lives in the footsteps of Jesus. Now today is Trinity Sunday. We celebrate how God's revelation to us has taken place. Now, Trinity Sunday moves as does Easter. When Easter is, that sets when Trinity Sunday. First, it begins with Sunday of Ascension, which was May 21st this year. Pentecost, last Sunday, May 28th. And today, June 4th, Trinity Sunday. And that varies depending on Easter. Paul concludes in his marching orders with a trinity of simple words. The trinity is live in peace. We could describe this peace as tranquility, harmony, security. The peace can come individually in our personal lives with God through the trinity. Now, Trinity Sunday is a Christian fe festival. It's widely celebrated, especially through Western churches. It falls on the first Sunday after Pentecost, which is the 50th day after Easter. Trinity Sunday, in essence, celebrates a mystery. A mystery of faith, a mystery of unity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's, we use illustrations of a tripod. We use illustrations of the apple. We use illustrations of the three states of water. And there's others, but they all are not total in trying to describe the Trinity. Now, people will say it's not explicitly mentioned in Scripture. There's nowhere it says this is the Trinity. But it's powerfully present in Scripture. Therefore, go and make, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We read of the Trinity. Now, many churches celebrate with the symbols of fire, wind, and a dove. Now, this peace is not something that should just be kept to ourselves. When God, through the triune God, gives us peace, 
is something that we can share with others. So let's now be off into this week, this month, this year, with the marching orders of our triune God. Let us pray. Almighty God, no one is wisdom before the dawn of creation. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, perfect love made flesh, Holy Spirit of God ever present. O hidden source of life wrapped into perfect trinity, we meditate upon the great and gracious plan which you have brought to pass, that men and women like us sh should look beyond creation to worship you as the creator of all things. In the beginning, you created across the face of the deep and brought out a space and time and then material substance, the atom and the molecule, the crystallite form, then the first germ of life and the long upward striving of all things that swim and creep and fly. And then the miracle of intelligence and consciousness beginning of mystery and the building of the first altar, and then the saying of the first prayer. O oh, hidden love of God, forgive us for those times when we have taken this mystery for granted. And forgive us all the more for times when we thought that we had unraveled the mystery. And those times we thought we knew it all, the how, the where, the why, the when, Almighty God, let us not harbor anything in our hearts that might spoil our fellowship with you or with one another. Work with us and within us. Do what you will with us. Make us what you want of us. Change us as we need changing. Use us as your will requires. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.